Between 1863 and 1869, three American railway companies completed a project to connect the existing East Coast Railway network with railroads on the West Coast. The 1,912 miles of track, including 19 tunnels through granite mountains that were needed to complete the Transcontinental Railroad, was an amazing engineering feat for a country that already had more miles of railway than the rest of the world combined. And yet the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad was not the only amazing feat of American railroad engineering in history. Because in 1886, railways in the South managed to convert the gauge on an estimated 11,500 miles of railway track in a period of just 36 hours. It is a little known piece of American railroad history that deserves to be remembered. The development of rail transport that eventually evolved into modern railways started with the carts used to move ore in mineral extraction, developed largely in the 16th century in Europe. Early tracks used wooden rails, but as technology developed, cast iron and then wrought iron rails replaced the wooden rails. Rails called plateways, which used L-shaped rails with the upper side of the L holding the wheels in place, developed in the 18th century, but as the weight of the railway carts increased, the plateways proved too fragile. Edge rails with a flat rail and a flanged railway wheel became the norm in the early part of the 19th century, as railways became more common and Scottish inventor James Watt's improvement of the steam engine allowed for the successful development of steam locomotives to pull railway cars. But the development of edge rails and steam locomotives pressed another issue, that of railway gauge. Track gauge represents the spacing of the rails on a railway track and is measured between the interfaces of the load-bearing rails. Plateways are relatively forgiving of car axle widths, although gauge is still meaningful. Edge rails require a fairly precise fit of the flanged wheel to the track, and gauge becomes more important, as cars and locomotives built for one gauge will not fit on tracks for another gauge. Track gauge is an important factor. Wider gauges are more stable and generally allow heavier loads, but are more expensive, requiring heavier cars and locomotives and a larger right-of-way. Narrower gauges are less stable, but carry smaller cars and use a smaller right-of-way. In Great Britain, that led to a conflict in the first half of the 19th century between the 7-foot, or broad gauge, of the Great Western Railway and the 4-foot, 8 and one half inch standard gauge used by the Liverpool and Manchester and London and Birmingham Railways. The so-called gauge wars were an economic competition over control of lines, but the cost of transferring goods at the point where incompatible lines met, called the break of gauge, finally forced Parliament to act. The Regulating the Gauge of Railways Act of 1846 stipulated that new lines would be made on the standard gauge unless they were directly connected to the current broad gauge network. In many ways, the standard gauge is a reasonable compromise. In fact, research on ancient Roman roads suggests they used a very similar axle width on their wagons and chariots. While the demands of wagons and trains are somewhat different, they're both gauged on the size of human beings. A wagon with an axle width of 4 foot 8.5 inches comfortably fits two passengers side by side. A railway car built for a 4 foot 8.5 inch gauge comfortably fits two passengers on either side, separated by a central aisle. The United States started adopting rail in the 18th century and by the mid-1820s had established common carriers like the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. While there was relatively more rail development in the more industrialized north, railroads were also developed in the south, where the South Carolina Canal and Railroad Company became the first railroad to operate a locomotive to be built entirely within the United States for railway service. While railways in the United States started out using a number of different gauges, in general, railways in the north tended to use the standard gauge, whereas railways in the south developed on a five-foot or broader rail that better fit cars that were built to carry cotton bales. At first this wasn't a problem, as there was not a lot of rail commerce between the North and South, although the difference did play a role in delaying funding for the Transcontinental Railroad, as in 1860 representatives from the South were advocating for a more southerly route. The coming of the Civil War meant that the Southern representatives were no longer a concern, and Congress passed the Pacific Railroad Act in 1862 that not only guaranteed the central route for the Transcontinental Railroad, but stipulated that the entire route would be built on the standard gauge. The Union was able to leverage their larger rail network during the war, and the Union blockade contributed to a decline in Southern Rail as they could not get new equipment and spare parts. But the difference in gauges did make it more difficult for the Union to move troops by rail in the South. After the war, during the period of Reconstruction, trade between the North and South grew substantially. The Southern Railroad system was largely repaired and expanded, but the gauge difference started to become more of an obstacle. At first, cars had to be laboriously unloaded and reloaded at the point of break of gauge. 
Then an ingenious device called the Ramsey Car Apparatus was used to change the trucks under a car without having to reload the cargo. Still, the process was expensive and took time. In 1884 and 1885, two lines that operated in both the North and South, the Illinois Central and the Mobile in Ohio, switched to a standard gauge. This allowed them to be more efficient and put pressure on other Southern railways to compete. In February of 1886, operating officers of the South Railroads met in Atlanta and agreed to change the Southern gauge. Curiously, they did not adopt the standard 4 foot 8 and 1 half inch gauge, but the slightly broader 4 foot 9 inch gauge used by the Pennsylvania Railroad, with which many of the southern lines connected. While trains from the two gauges were largely compatible, it was short-sighted of the committee not to move to the 4 foot 8 and a half inch gauge, that as the track gauge of the Transcontinental Railroad was clearly the gauge of the future. Still, the commission went with the 4 foot 9 inch Pennsylvania gauge. Understand the sheer magnitude of this process. Not only did they have to convert some 11,500 miles of rail, but also all the locomotives and rolling stock. And as trains would not be able to operate during the switch, it was important that the switchover occur as quickly as possible. The date for the switch was set between Monday, May 31st and Tuesday, June 1st. That gave just four months to prepare for the massive undertaking. Only one rail had to be moved, so rails all along the way were marked for the new gauge using a three inch length of pipe. As many as two and three of the spikes on the inside of the rail were removed, moved to the new gauge and partially hammered, ready for when the rail was to be moved. Where possible, axles on the rolling stock were modified ahead of time. Some engines were mounted with plate shaped wheels. Turned out it fit the old gauge. On the day of the switch, the wheel would be reversed and fit the new gauge. Some axles were laid for the new gauge and had a ring added to hold the wheel at the old gauge. During the switch, the ring was removed and the wheel moved to the new gauge. Lays were positioned along the lines in order to convert rolling stock that could not be modified ahead of time. In some cases, new tools were invented, such as a circular pipe that could be hooked into a city gas works, creating a torch to modify axles. As the date approached, lines that could be easily cleared of traffic were converted. When the day came and the lines were cleared, crews started working at 3.30 a.m. The crews would pull the spikes, move the rails to the marked spot, and hammer new spikes. Some lines gave crews a mileage quota. Others sent a crew a direction and told them to stop when they ran into a crew working the other direction. Some lines gave bonuses for extra miles converted, although that meant that some of the work was sloppily done. Trains were prepared with the new gauge carrying an extra work crew. The train serves as a test of the line, and if it caught up with a crew that was behind schedule, the extra crew could jump out and assist to get back on schedule. The work was done with amazing speed. In a period of just 36 hours, virtually the entirety of the Southern Railway lines, an estimated 11,500 miles worth, as well as their locomotives and cars, had been converted. The work was done so economically and so quietly, the Journal of the Association of Engineer Societies noted, that the public hardly realized it was in progress. The ability to make such a massive change in such a short period of time with so little disruption is a testament to the value of the planning. One of the railways had managed to shut down a 200 mile length of track early and so they had trained all their crews on the process before the critical day came. Presetting crews and support equipment and testing processes was critical. In short, planning guaranteed success. The cost of the switch was about $100 per mile of track, which is a, roughly the equivalent of $2,100 in today's dollars, and that was easily made up with the increased efficiency. The gauge change was part of the golden age of American rail, and came during a dynamic period in American history when railroads were helping to facilitate a massive economic shift. In 1880, nearly half of the U.S. workforce worked in agriculture, while only one in seven worked in manufacturing. By 1920, agriculture and manufacturing represented almost equal shares of the workforce. But the immediate impact of the switch was somewhat surprising. The increased standardization should have resulted in lower shipping costs because of greater efficiency. But a 2016 analysis of route level traffic data determined that while the switch moved some commerce from riverboats to railways, overall freight traffic did not increase. The reason? Anti-competitive practices on the part of the railroad cartels kept them from passing on the savings in terms of lower shipping costs. The railway owners just pocketed the savings. The analysis suggests that if they passed on just 50% of the savings in terms of lower shipping costs, it would have caused an overall 10% increase in overall trade. Ironically, it was the same level of cooperation and economic incentive that allowed the switch to be made so quickly and efficiently that prevented the full realization of the value of the switch. I'm the History Guy, and I hope you enjoyed this edition of my series of short snippets of forgotten history about 10 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button, which is there on your left. 
If you have any questions or comments, feel free to write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. And if you'd like more snippets of Gotham history, all you need to do is subscribe.